I look around and I go, who did all of this? Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Palette. I'm your host, Whitney Rosenson, owner of Art Dimensions, and I want to thank you so much for joining me here today. I am really pleased to be talking with Frida Miller today, a top-notch artist who works in various media and who has been creating art since 1978. Frida and I have worked together for many years, and I even hosted an exhibition of her work at the Art Dimensions Gallery in Westwood, California, about 10 years ago. So let's get started. Hi, Frida. Hi, Whitney. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much for being here and welcome to the podcast. How are you? I'm good. Good. Well, I'm excited for everyone listening, including myself, to learn more about you, your incredible background, and your creative process. Did you always want to be an artist? I, I don't think I knew what an artist was when I was young, but of course, I always made art. I was fortunate. I had people champion me, my teachers, my parents. Not everybody's that lucky. They kind of made me think I was an artist, whatever that would mean. So kind of, you know, kind of, it was always there. It was always there. I love that. What's the first creative project you remember? Oh, well, I, it, I'm sure it's not the first one because it, it's, it's hard to think back that far. But I did think of something that when I was going to UCLA, which was in the 70s, I was doing a project for the a student show. I was already in my 30s. I had two children and I had returned to college. Um, I took all these photos of myself in jeans and t-shirt and kind of hippie looking, long flowy hair. Right. And they were like in and out of focus. And I ended up being in the dark room for weeks and weeks and weeks, putting like three images on one page. And anyway, it was going to be this huge, wonderful project. As the day got closer, I got cold feet. And I got very anxious. I did learn from that. And I saw it recently. I was cleaning out some of my flat drawers in the studio and um, I came upon it and I looked at them and they're really cool. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> so those were exhibited or those were not at UCLA? They were not. They were not. Okay. But you, it's great. You still have them. What are you going to do with those photos? I don't know. I mean, I thought... I can plaster a wall with them. I don't know. I mean, there's like, they're 12 or 16 and they're probably, oh, bigger than 11 by 12. E I mean, eight, eight by 11 each. They're probably 11 by 14. So it's a, it's a wall. It is a wall. Oh, I can't wait to see that work. So one day well, I'll put them together. Oh, that would be awesome. Okay. So people now know that you are a photographer. Can you explain what hand tinting is and why you use it in some of your photographs? Oh, sure. I did have one instructor at UCLA. Her name was Judith Golden, and she did hand tinting, which introduced me to it. I liked it a lot. What I did, I didn't just hand tint. I would shoot it with that in mind, and I would add grain to it before I tinted it. I would add texture. They were developed lighter. I mean, I couldn't just take a regular black and white. I mean, I could, but that wasn't what I was looking for. So it, it was a whole kind of system of doing it. And then I loved painting. It gave me an opportunity to do that. I was able to bring out a sensuous, my color sense. Um, they became me. When you talk about the color, I, I imagine your fruits and vegetables series, which is... Right. You know, you'll take a, a still life shot of a piece of fruit or a vegetable, but then you'll hand tint right on that. And yeah, and they're just beautiful and they are very sensual. Thank you. Yes, they can, they kind of turn into maybe female figures in, in a way, maybe a bit of a metaphor. 
it was one series. I started it thinking, you know, I'd like to do something that is saleable. You know, not everything I do is going to go over someone's sofa or whatever. <laughs> right. But a lot of it does. Yes, absolutely. So, and back then, even less. Today, more. The conceptual work and so forth. It, it turned out to be really a, a, a commercial success for me. I, I probably sold 60 or 70 large pictures, photos of the hand tinting to both restaurants and people's homes. Oh, wonderful. Then I went back to my other more personal stuff. And one restaurant I know that your work is in is in Malibu. It's called Tradenoy at the Tradenoy. Malibu Country Mart. Yes. And all your work is still there? Yes. Oh, yeah. I've been out there and I've seen it. And they opened other restaurants and kept buying my work, which was very nice. It's nice to go out there and see it. Yeah. And it, I remember eating there and it looked, all the fruits and vegetables look amazing. It works. It definitely works. Yeah. For a restaurant, it's perfect. Yeah. Well, for those listeners who don't know who you are, can you give us a brief snapshot of your journey to where you are today, including your graduate work at UCLA? I, I, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, moved to LA, grew up here, met my husband when I was 15. I'm still married to him. You know, a lot of my work does not look like I've been married all these years, <laughs> um, but I, he, he's been my champion. He's been wonderful. He, he's never been threatened by it or any of that. So I'm happy to be able to say that. I had two years of college behind me of advertising art. I mean, at that time, I think I thought that's what art was. You go to work and it's advertising art, but I didn't. You know, I completed a couple of years. And then in my earlier 30s, when my children were like 10 and 11, my two children, I started applying back to UCLA. And I had to go to, through extension and take Spanish and <laughs> philosophy and things that I probably thought I would never need again in my life. And to finish up your degree. Yes. So I got in. I got in as a junior. Could I would drop my children off at school in the morning and I would go on to UCLA. I couldn't imagine being happier. It was just, you know, the, a highlight. Awesome. You know, I fit in in my own way. There were not a lot of women going back to college at that time. In fact, one of my models was a student there and she, I used her mainly in my book, Here Comes the Bride and Other Nightmares. After I graduated UCLA, I worked with Robert Heineken, who was head of the photo department, Judith Golden, who I mentioned, hand tinting, and Joanne Callis, who was a TA at the time. And they totally influenced me, which professors often do with students. Robert Heineken's work was sensual, sexual, veered on pornography in places, and he gave me permission to shoot nudity and to do whatever I wanted. I mean, thank you, Robert Heineken. <laughs> of course, mine's much more subtle. <laughs> you were active in creating sets and wardrobe. and That's, Yes. Okay. So I had my first exhibit, solo exhibit at Soho Camera Works in LA, which was a co-op photo gallery. I met a photographer there who was a commercial photographer. And he said to me, how would you like to come to work for me and be my stylist? And I said, what's a stylist? <laughs> and yes, I'll do it. <laughs> Great experience, right? Yeah, I worked for him for four years and I did props, wardrobe sets, casting, location scouting together with him. Wow. I learned on the job and we just had a wonderful relationship. And then I went on and I opened my own business and it was called Prop Connection West. And I sent out mailers to the East Coast and Midwest 
and they were so appreciative. I mean, the photographer, the LA photographers were kind of hip slick and cool. The Midwest photographers were really nice people. <laughs> but what did your business offer? I mean, what? I could send them, you know, bikinis in their winter. I could send them fruits and vegetables that they couldn't get. But I would also set up their whole shot in LA because they would come out to LA because of the good weather. When they got here, I'd have the casting done, the wardrobe done, location, everything. You know, it had to all be approved by their team of suits or whatever you call them. And I kind of ran the show. I was really fortunate. The, those mailers just hit it. Yeah. And I had several of really, you know, well-known photographers. It was all national, national print ads. It was exciting. It was exhausting. It was, it was both. <laughs> Four years of excitement. It wasn't glamorous. <laughs> I did the freelance styling for 17 more years after oh. the four years. Oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. And I was doing my own art at the time. Okay. Well, let's go back to your art for a little bit. Um, I know you've got your photography and I know you focus on the feminine in your work. Why do you focus on the feminine and what does it mean to you? It means everything. First of all, I know about the feminine from myself. I wouldn't even try to project what a, a, a male person would think. I don't talk a lot. Right now I'm talking, but <laughs> I, I don't talk a lot. My art is really my voice. I mean, I'm not a chatty person. It gives me a way to express my own dreams, nightmares, conflicts, guilt, um, roles women play. It could be considered beautiful, but something then goes into it to make it a miss or things are not what they seem, which runs through all my work. So a lot of your work is, a, or all of your work is, or there's an underlying meaning yes. or... Exactly. Even with the fruits and vegetables? Well, no, except for the more the sensuality that myself as a woman would add to it. Right, right. Who are some of your greatest influences, Frida? Well, as I mentioned, Robert Heineken, definitely, and Judith Golden and Joanne Callis. But besides that, Frida Kahlo, I love all her blood and guts and her showing not that I'm happy she had blood and guts, but that she showed her insides. Yeah. And that was important to me. Magritte, I, I like him a lot. A surrealist. And some of my fruits and vegetables might be kind of those kind of metaphors, large and oversized. And Ava Hess, who was um, a wonderful female artist who died young. Those are your, well, those are, amazing, amazing artists. What about your assemblages? I, I want everyone to understand what they are, you know, how many you've created over all these years. Sure. And you know, a lot of them because they were in my fertile dreams exhibit. Yes. At the gallery in Westwood. Yes. Lovely. It was a gorgeous, gorgeous gallery. You did a great job there. And oh, I'm thank you. lucky to to be shown there. And we had a super fun opening. So the, the assemblages, I just started putting things together. I'm, I'm a, a, a vintage resale shop. I, I'm just always there. I'm always looking and searching for something that speaks to me. And I could have something in the drawers in my studio or hanging up somewhere that I have no idea when I'm going to use them. I have enough in there now to for three lifetimes, probably, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately. But I kind of know where everything is in my head. And I'll be doing something and, you know, I think, oh, that'll work here. Generally, with the assemblages, when I'm almost done, I need to go on a search for that one last piece, which is, is kind of exciting. It, it's just, it's, putting things together, it's tactile, it's juxtaposing textures. I can say often what I like to say, they are labor intense, most of them. 
you know, I've learned to do a little bit of hammering and sawing and gluing and all that sort of stuff. I don't know, they just kind of grew out of all my propping and wardrobing and sets because that's what goes into them. I just want everyone to understand, you know, I'm thinking of that one assemblage called the coop. Oh, yeah. Can you remind me and everyone out there listening what that consists of so they can sort of visualize what the assemblage is? Oh, it's white case, kind of like a a chicken. It has like chicken wire on it. And it's kind of like a box, but it, it opens. It's got a shelf. And so you can see through the chicken wire. And then it has a flat top and it's vintage. Um, So this piece, it has, oh, it has five or six babies in there, kind of crawling out of eggs. And I I found these six vintage tiny babies, porcelain, on on eBay. And, And you don't usually find like six of the same thing. You'll find one or two. And they're kind of coming out of the eggs I cracked. And then you can close it and see them inside, or you could open it and they're kind of hanging out. So it is a coop. It's a coop. There is a bit of confinement there. Confinement also runs through my work in one way or another. And then on top, I have a a woman. I can't remember what she is. But she's kind of, I guess, the mother of it all. I mean, obviously, a mother is the symbol of femininity, or you've got the babies, but why the coop? I mean, why did you choose to create the chicken wire and make it like a chicken coop? Like the, the you just mentioned confinement. What does that mean to you? I, I see it in women's lives, confined to certain social mores. I agree, by the way. Okay, they could be confined in in a job, in a marriage, in, in other words, not coming out as loudly as maybe a male might. Right. So they're still, they're confined within themselves. It's not like they're in jail or anything, but I've done a lot, I've done other pieces where the women are also confined. So I think it's more an intuitive, organic it, it, it really speaks to me. Well, how many assemblages do you have in your home currently? Oh, I don't know. Maybe 20 or 25. I, I don't know. Wow. I, have some, I have some in the studio. I have some in the dining room where I am now and tons in the living room. And I just put some upstairs in, in my hallway. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. You should, you have work of your own in your home. What other artists' works do you have in your home? Or is it mostly just all of your work? I don't anymore. I had a piece by Judith Golden. I have an impression, a painting by an impressionist artist whose name escapes me right now. No, I really, and there is no room. I mean, we've never been collectors and, and I never hung my own work. For years and years and years, it was like, oh, how can I hang my own work? And now, I mean, my house is kind of, you've been here. It's sort of a gallery. Yeah. (laughs) Which I love. And I look around all of this. I mean, all of it was so organic and so intuitive. I look around and I go, who did all this? You know? And it was you. It it was like magical. Oh. After all these years that it, it just came out of me. I mean, I don't even remember putting it together. It's like, well, you've been an artist. I don't want to, you know, give away anything, but you've, you've been doing this for a long time. You're professional. Professionally since 1978. So, and I was in my thirties. So there you go. I was lucky enough to to be presented with a testimonial that your sister, your late sister wrote about you. And I want you to read it because I think it it really nicely captures you, you, your essence and your work. So can you read that for us? And this piece really, she wrote it after she saw the Here Comes the Bride and Other Nightmares book. So that's kind of what it relates to. And in that book, I have a lot of work from the Fertile Dream series and from the series of women and props and wardrobe and all of that. 
Okay, Frida Miller's journey in art reflects a personal narrative that also captures the layers and conflicting dualities of women's realities as they attempt to satisfy the stereotypes and myths of marriage and motherhood. The women seem staged, are faceless, perhaps voiceless, static, and objectified like props placed in scenarios that serve to bolster the image of marriage. The painterly quality of her photography derives from her subtle hand tinting. The prolific use of veils creates an impressionist mist-like quality that literally thinly veils their nakedness and vulnerability. Aprons, perhaps also a metaphor for domesticity, are on clotheslines held in place by clothespins. They blow in the wind, but cannot escape. Overall, Miller has succeeded in managing an extremely complex task of integrating dualities without compromising her art or narrative. And my sister's name was Faye Margolis, and she was an artist first, five years younger than me though, and then became a psychologist. Was it just the two of you? No, I have a brother. Okay, so there's also. three of you. My last question is 100 years from now, what do you hope people will write about your work? She had a body of work that was unique and personal and was screaming for women's equality in her own quiet way. <laughs> Fabulous. Frida, this was so inspiring and so much fun for me, and I hope it was for you as well. I truly appreciate you talking with me and giving our listeners a glimpse into your creative world. Thank you. So listeners, you can just email me through the Art Dimensions website if you have any questions about Frida's work, and be sure to check out her amazing photographs on the site as well, which is artdimensionsonline.com. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram at Art Dimensions. And to everyone out there listening, and Frida too, take care and happy creating. <laughs>